Okay. Welcome back. Thanks for coming again. Uh, now we have both on drill with Jesus to. What else does Jesus to do? Yeah, this this by its very nature is going to be a helter skelter talk. It's going to be little bits of this and a little bits of that. And there's like I don't know, 15 or 20 different possible things that I'm going to talk about. I can't remember how many subtopics there are in this thing. But the first one we're going to talk about is texture analysis. <clears throat> now, what is texture? Well, it's simply non-random orientations of the crystallites in a solid. If we have a solid which has random orientations and the crystal orientations are basically in all directions, um, and if you look at the distribution as a pole figure, the pole figure is flat. And the units on a pole figure are something like something, it's called multiples of a random distribution. Think about that little phrase, because if it's random, then the MRD, a multiple of a random distribution, is one. So this thing is one everywhere. On the other hand, if you had a a metal wire which has been drawn through a die, then all the little crystallites within there are oriented with one of the axes, preferentially along the wire axis. And I've sort of drawn this little cartoon which has the A axis or the 100 direction along the wire direction. And incidentally, if the stuff is cubic, then there's actually three different axes, each one of which could be oriented along the wire direction. So what you see then is basically a bullseye, which is a peak in the middle, which is the sort of 100 direction, is preferentially along the axis of the wire. And then there's this rim around the outside because the other two axes are at 90 degrees to that. And so that's, that's what you see is for wire texture. Uh, Pole figures for an, um, tend to be boring, so there is a, something called an inverse pole figure, which is basically the other way around, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The way you describe these things is something called an orientation distribution function, which is the probability of finding a particular orientation of a crystal within the solid. And this thing, by the way, is a four-dimensional object because you have two orientations for the crystallite and two orientations for the sample itself. And so that winds up being four coordinates that you have to deal with. Um, you do the measurement by diffraction, and what you see is that instead of a uniform ring in a Debye-Scherer ring, it's broken up into little segments. And here's a little cartoon showing different, different uh, uh, the buy share cones and they have different distribution of, of spots and streaks and whatnot because of the different orientations. Um, <clears throat> so if you and then if you rotate the sample, this pattern of um, interrupted rings will actually change because you get different different crystallites will come into diffraction um, depending on what the orientation of the sample is. And so that tells you how you actually measure texture. What you have to do is you have to put the sample in the beam, measure the diffraction pattern, change the orientation of the crystal, do it again, repeat until you're, until you're done. And it's a question of how many you have to, you have to collect, and it's usually a lot. Okay, how do you describe this? Well, you use something called the spherical harmonics model, and here's the equation for it. Um, <clears throat> now, you may say, what are these things? Well, first of all, what you see is basically a projection of this, of this equation along either uh, a given HKL, that's the H, or a given sample direction, that's Y, um, will then dictate what the correction is for that particular structure factor. Um, now, what are these pieces? These two pieces are then symmetrized spherical harmonics. Well, what the heck are spherical harmonics? Do you remember your education in atomic orbitals? 
These are the angular components of the atomic orbitals. It's exactly the same set of functions. And they have all the same sort of shapes. The first one is a sphere. The second one looks like a p orbital. The second one looks like a, a d orbital and so forth. But those are the functions. And there's two sets of them. One's associated with the sample and the other one's associated with the crystal structure. Um, <clears throat> and each of these things has its own symmetry. So the, so the space group dictates the symmetry of the, of the crystal spherical harmonics and the symmetry of the sample, whether it's, a, whether it's a wire or a rolled plate or what have you, dictates the symmetry of the sample component of the spherical harmonics. <clears throat> uh, the, the, each one of these terms then has a, has a coefficient and that's actually the refinable parameter is this C, um, which has a principal, if you like, quantum number, again, thinking about atomic orbitals, and then the individual, um, comp the individual quantum numbers for each of the things. So, so this winds up being pretty complicated, but nonetheless, the one thing, that's, one thing about these spherical harmonics terms is that they are orthogonal to each other. Okay, they are orthogonal functions. And so what that makes them is, is reasonably stable in a, in a, in a refinement, let's say a reed belt refinement. <clears throat> um, a pole figure then is a projection of this thing along um, a, given a given HKL. So you'll have pole figures which are designated 100 or 110 or 200, something like that which refers to the HKL index that you're looking at this distribution is. An inverse pole figure, which is listed here, is basically the same idea, but it's along a given sample direction. And what you're asking is what are the distribution of the HKLs around a given sample direction? So it's basically one's the inverse of the other. <clears throat> so in a refelt refinement, you have the CI the C's and three orientation angles, which, which allows you to find where the sample is relative to the goniometer dim dimensions. Um, and in GSAS2, this is used as both a correction for preferred orientation, which is the nuisance part of texture, or for texture analysis, which is the interesting part of texture. Of texture. <clears throat> okay. So here's, here's an example. This is one of the tutorials in GSAS2 for doing texture analysis. We have this diffraction pattern of a nickel titanium shape memory alloy, uh, which has two phases in it, a so-called B2 and a so-called B19 prime phase. Um, the B2 is cubic and the other one I think is monoclinic. If I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> and because of the wire symmetry, you only need a quarter of this image for doing the texture analysis, just this much. And you can see the pattern of the intensities um, for the on each of the rings really changes dramatically as you go around the azimuth, and that's what the signature of the, having texture is. <clears throat> So what one does is you do the integration, but you do it so-called caked, and so 10 degree increments, because what you're trying to do is sampling the variation of the intensity from this uh, slice versus that slice versus that slice, and that gives you enough information to be able to extract out what the texture is. <clears throat> and you do this, and you fit the various uh, C terms, and the orientation of the sample, which is very close to zero, 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 and you get uh, texture results where what we see here is the pole, this is the inverse pole figures. The pole figures themselves are rather boring because they're just a bunch of bullseyes, you know, doesn't tell you very much. But the inverse pole figures tell you what the, where the, where each of these directions are. And I, Yeah, so the 001 is the sample direction along the wire. Um, 
And then the distribution is, um, let's see if I remember how <laughs> this all works. So this is the 110 reflection. This is the 010 reflection. That's the 100 reflection. Okay? And you can see that the, uh, the orientation of them with respect to the wire axis. And this is for the B19, and I forget what this axis is, but it's really strongly um, textured. This goes up to something like 12 times a random distribution. <clears throat> okay, completely different subject. This is fitting of PDFs. And there's two ways of doing this, actually now three, I think, because uh, Brian Toby's been working on a third one. And each one of these things uses someone else's software to do the actual fitting. And so what we do in GSAS 2 is that we either, um, well, what we do, I think in all three cases, is that we gather the information, create the files that are used to run the other program, submit it to the other program, occasionally interrogate that other program as to what the intermediate results are, and report it back to GSAS 2. And then when it's done, then GSAS 2 will then display basically the results and the resulting structures that you get from the other program. <clears throat> and the assumption in this, this particular case for these things is that that other program is running on your machine. It's not running somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> so basically what this does, this one of these is the so-called big box program RMC profile, which is written by the folks at uh, ISIS and uh, SNS, and this was originally developed mostly for neutron uh, PDFs, but it also can be used for X-rays, X-ray PDFs. And what GSAS2 provides is a, a GUI interface for setting up these this program. The the actual program itself, the in, the the input to it is basically text files of commands and data. And they're not easy to set up if you don't know what you're doing. So, and you know, easily makes mistakes, things like that. So what we do is we provide the GUI interface to allow you to set this thing up without errors and actually have a successful run. Um, and you can then save those setup controls and be able to reuse them and rerun the thing uh, or even run it and, and, and sort of update it and so forth. The thing about RMC Profile is it could run for hours, you know, on a big, big problem. Uh, you, you could easily have it run for five or six hours in order to get a result. So what does RMC Profile do? In a big box simulation, what you do is you take the unit cell and you multiply it out so that it's a large box of atoms, which are then moved around by RNC profile to match the PDF and the diffraction data simultaneously. Okay, that's what it's trying to do. And the kind of intermediate results that you get are... Um, a little hard to see this perhaps, but you get the G of R, which is the, uh, the PDF or radial distribution function itself, and you also get its partial, uh, partial functions, which are the various interatomic contributions to it, so you can tell which peaks came from which atom pairs. Um, and uh, also there's something called S of Q, which is the scattering factor corrected for all the various things, and that gives you also the partials, which are the contributions to it, so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, you also fit the uh, powder diffraction pattern itself directly uh, from the model. Uh, in this particular case, you can see here, this is actually the repelt refinement, but this is the, also the, the fit from RNC profile to that same data using this big box model. And this is what the interface looks like. Uh, and I'm not going to explain what it is, except to say that it's got uh, sort of startup stuff and data, the size of the box, uh, the various uh, limitations on the movement of the atoms, uh, 
anything that you wish to impose as additional constraints on them, like interatomic distances, uh, the data sets that's used, and somewhere up in here under operations is a go button that says go and do the calculation. Okay, and here's a result. Here is a result. This one is for uh, sulfur hexafluoride. Now the problem with sulfur hexafluoride is that it packs in a body center cubic structure. Okay, sulfur in the middle, surrounded by the octahedron of uh, fluorine atoms and the same thing in each of the corners. And this is the result from the reed belt refinement. What you get are basically pancake shaped anisotropic temperature factors. And when you look at the bond length between sulfur and fluorine, it's too short. And the reason why it's too short is because it runs into the next one on the next cell over and it's, it, it can't get to the right value. So what it does is it, is it rotates the octahedra so that they're displaced from each other and what you see then is this displacement of the individual uh, octahedra. The, this is basically taking the big box model and collapsing it back down to um, a single unit cell. And so each one of these sol uh, fluorine positions was where it was in one of the individual cells in the big box, transformed back into the original cell. So that's why there's a whole pile up of these things. And notice that, that the, the distribution of fluorine sites pretty much represents the anisotropic temperature factors that you saw. And the individual bond lengths then are actually sort of from sulfur down to the various places in that distribution. <clears throat> okay. Um, now here's a case where GSAS2 will actually call something else out on the web pull in an answer from that other program and use it in an analysis inside GSAS2. And there's several examples of the kind of that kind of thing that GSAS2 does. It interacts with a program somewhere else in the world uh, to pull in a result. The program here is something called isodistort, which <coughs> resides at uh, Brigham Young University in Utah written by Branton Campbell, and I forget what the other guy's name is offhand. And what it does is that if you have an idealized parent structure and a distorted structure, when which has been a phase change, this commonly happens with perovskites and things of that sort, um, the, what isodistort will do is it will say, here are the distortion modes of the parent structure that represent the child structure. In other words, how did you have to move that structure in order to get to the, uh, to the other one, to the actual one? And this involves modes of rotations and translations of the group of atoms within the parent structure. And these things are dictated by the symmetry of both the parent structure and the target structure. And what GSAS2 does is it's the, the, the actual isodistort operation is a series of web pages. And you, you call it up, you put stuff into the web page, you tell it to go, and it comes back with another web page. You put more stuff in and it goes off and comes back with yet another one. And it's got to do this like five or six times uh, to try to, re to recover what these, these actual modes are. And what we've done in GSAS2 is basically buried all that stuff. And we call, GSAS2 then calls the website, puts in the information, gets back the result as a file, fills that stuff in, puts it in. You don't even see any of this stuff go on. <clears throat> So the GSAS2 interface then allows you to pick out what it is you want to tell it. Um, and then it comes back uh, through this multi-step process that you don't see with the actual modes and the values of the distortion and little sliders. And it actually will allow you to draw the structure. And if you manipulate the sliders, you can actually see the, what the rotations are and translations of the individual atoms. Um, 
These modes then, in the next slide, can be used in this program, which is a so-called small box modeling. And this again is a standalone program that sits on your computer that GSAS2 calls with all the appropriate information. It runs and it comes back over the, with a result. Um, and these rather complicated, you can't see, re, see these constraints on atom positions were generated by running ISO distort. So this is a case in which we knew what the parent structure is, we know what this child structure is, and what, we, what we're interested in this particular case is how does this thing change with temperature? What happens to those modes as we change the temperature? Now you could do this as a sequential refinement of the atom positions, but that doesn't really tell you what's going on with the actual motion of the, of the pieces of the structure, what this does. So here's the fit. You can do the fits to PDFs um, <clears throat> because that's what PDF fit does. This is a so-called small box modeling routine in which the unit, the unit cell is what's used to actually do the fitting as opposed to the large box one. Um, and here's the, this one is the PDF at one of the temperatures and the fit to it. And this then is the result of a sequential fit through a whole series of PDFs taken at different temperatures. And one of the things you can see here is you increase the temperature, there's this change in the symmetry here and a couple of the modes become degenerate because of the change in the symmetry. You can actually see them match up here and also match up here. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven modes, you then reduce to one, two, three, four, five modes because of the change in symmetry. And you can actually see the transition right here. And in each case, you can draw the structure out and actually GSAS2 has a way of stepping through the temperature so you can actually see the structure change as a function of temperature right in front of your eyes. <clears throat> I don't show that as a movie. Okay, another completely different topic. Protein shape analysis. Um, <clears throat> one of the things of interest to protein people doing pro proteins is what does the thing look like? Okay, you've got a protein, it does something. It has a shape. Um, and if you do small angle scattering on a solution of that particular protein, you'll get a curve that looks something like this. Can you extract out what the shape of the protein is from that curve? Well, one way to do this is through something called uh, a bead model, which takes little beads of scattering and simply puts them into an object, jiggling them around until it matches the result, the observed data. And the process is to take this curve and literally make a PDF out of it. This is the same process that was used for the stuff I talked about earlier, except that the PDF looks like that. It's sort of a big lumpy peak. <clears throat> you then use this structure to develop a pile of, of beads, which are on kind of a loose lattice. You jiggle them around until it matches both the observed data and the P of R. And here's in this particular case is what this particular protein looks like. It's basically a donut. This, by the way, is the real structure of that protein is a donut. And so it actually reproduced the structure of the, of the protein. Not the individual atom positions, mind you, but the overall shape of the protein. And sometimes this is all they need to know about it. Uh, or this is the only thing they can get because you can't grow single crystals of this stuff. Okay, another subject, reflectometry. This is a case where, and I sort of humorously described this, it was with some people as watching paint dry. <laughs> okay, you have a surface, say silicon, and you layer stuff on it, and you put another layer of stuff on it, and you want to ask the question is, how thick are the layers? And do the layers intermix? And what happens at the upper surface? Does, is it smooth or is it rough or what have you? So you do that by bringing a 
incident beam at a very shallow angle and basically bounce it off the surface of the, of the, of the sample. And what you get then are basically uh, rings of surface of, of reflections, okay? Basically a ripple of reflections. <clears throat> That's this kind of thing. And you can do this with x-rays or neutrons. <clears throat> and the trick here then is to try to represent what the underlying layer structure is. There's no identification of the stuff that's used to make up the layers apart from composition because the composition affects what the scattering power is and that's all you really need to know about it. So <clears throat> this thing can be multiple layers, it can be the same kind of layering repeated over and over and over again uh, and so forth. And so you have to give a representation of what the scattering power is in each of the layers and how thick they are. <coughs> and this has recently been improved to put sliders on some of these parameters so that you can easily sort of move it around to get a, a good trial position. And then you do a refinement, a little bit like reed belt refinement. Uh, and you get a model which consists of this of the scattering power, that's what this thing is, as a function of thickness away from the substrate. Um, <clears throat> and, or maybe from the top surface, actually, I think that's the way it's defined. So uh, this is the vacuum, this is the first layer, and there's a little bit of roughness on the surface of the, on the upper surface of it. Um, and then there's a bit of roughness between that layer and the next layer, and this is then the substrate. And so you can tell, basically, this is what's on the, on the surface of this particular material. Um, yeah, okay, another thing. Cluster analysis, this is brand new. I've just been, been putting it in and checking it out. There's no documentation, there's no tutorial yet. That's on my list of things to do. So what is cluster analysis about? It's simply another way to look at your data, particularly if you've got a lot of it. And you wanna ask, how much of this data is similar to other parts of the data? That's a reasonably fair question, okay? Is, on how many different kinds of data am I looking at? So this is the kind of thing that would happen if, if let's suppose that you had a sample which consisted of a thousand wells of sample preparations and each one of them was done under slightly different chemical conditions and you want to say well which which ones of these are similar and which ones of these are different now when you look at the data itself and here's an example it's a little hard to tell um, but the actual fact is in is that the, for this is tungsten trioxide is that between here and here I've changed the temperature between room temperature around 1200 degrees back to room temperature and there's five phase changes in there. Okay, and that's a little hard to tell by looking at the, at the 100 or so powder patterns. But the idea with the, text, with the cluster analysis is to be able to be able to see what they are. In fact, so this then is a representation of the difference between the various data sets. Now, it, <clears throat> what you have to think about here is that each data set, each one of these powder patterns is a vector in a multi-dimensional space, okay? And the next one is another vector in a multi-dimensional space. And so a fair question is how far apart are these two vectors? And you can say how far apart they are and either the angle between them or the distance between the ends of the vectors. And there's lots of different ways of calculating this. There's about a dozen different ways of comparing these pairs of vectors. And this plot then is a map of the comparison between the vectors. And you may say, well, where's the, why is there an X? Remember I said the temperature goes up and the temperature goes back down. So the front half of the set of patterns is gonna be the same as the back half of the patterns, but in the opposite direction. So this thing goes from room temperature to high temperature back down to room temperature. And of course, 
the room temperature samples at this end are going to be the same as they are at that end. So that's where you get this, this feature on this side and this side. Um, and you can almost sort of see in this particular figure where the phase changes are. There's one about there, there's one here, actually two of them in there. There's another one right about there. And then you're back up to high temperature and it goes back the same way in the other direction. So when you do the cluster analysis, you try to cluster these observations into common, similar sort of patterns. And one way to do this is a so-called a dendogram, which is what this thing is. And I happen to know that there's five different phases, and so that's going to be that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one, and splitting it up. Um, and one another way of representing this is to take this thing and do a principal component analysis on that array, and then plot the points, the data points along here, um, as a function of the three principal components. And you wind up with this three-dimensional figure that traces out where they are. This is still under development. There's no help, no tutorials. I'm still working on it. All right, stacking faults. Could change the subject again. Um, GSAS2 uses a program called DIFAX, which does simulations of stacking faults. It's a Fortran program written many years ago, um, and the code is included in GSAS2, and the program is compiled and sits inside the GSAS2 directory. And GSAS2 calls it when appropriate is, and then comes back with the results from it. Um, <clears throat> here is a case, this is again from the tutorial, here's a powder pattern with stacking faults, and notice that the feature of stacking faults is you get these reflections that rise rapidly and then a long decay. And that's because the reflection in reciprocal space isn't a point, it's a streak. And that streak will then give you a powder pattern which has got a sharp rise and then a long decay as it works its way along the streak. Uh, this is to be not confused with the axial divergence, which goes the other way. This is long rise and then a sharp drop. That's axial divergence. This is stacking faults. So whenever you see this kind of signature in your powder pattern, you think stacking faults, okay? <clears throat> and whether you can do anything about them is another question. But basically, this is kaolinite, and here's uh, a layer of kaolinite, and here's another one, and they're, they're connected by hydrogen bonds, and so this, this connection is kind of weak, and it's easily displaced in one direction or another. So you get stacking faults because this layer gets displaced relative to that layer in a different unexpected direction from the space group. Uh, space group, by the way, is triclinic, so it gets a little messy. Um, here's a top view of the same sort of thing. You can see how the, how the uh, pairs of rings are arranged. And so you can do the simulation in DIFAX, and here's a reasonable simulation of the powder pattern with the model of showing some proportion of stacking in various directions. Five minutes, okay, I'm getting there. Okay, 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> Yet another subject, uh, incommensurate structures, and specifically three plus one commensurate, incommensurate structures, that's uh, four dimensions if you like. Um, <clears throat> What's going on here? First of all, uh, there's a book by Sanderbound Smolin, uh, which is really good about incommensurate crystallography, although he doesn't talk about magnetic structures at all, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, basically, what's going on is that if you get rows of spots like this that don't line up, okay? If you sort of stand back and close your eyes a little bit, you can sort of imagine that there is a sublattice in here, which is sort of there, 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 and there, and so forth. This is a single crystal X-ray pattern of sodium carbonate. And I think, as I made a comment earlier, is that it's so shocking how simple some of the materials are that give you incommensurate structures. Um, <clears throat> so the position of each one of these superlattice points 
is given by this equation, which is um, G, which is the substructure HKL, that's H, just the HKL, uh, plus a uh, small integer times a modulation vector. In this particular case, the modulation vector is this, which is roughly one sixth, zero, one third, but not quite. Okay, so that's why it makes it incommensurate. <clears throat> so each reflection then has four indices. Um, if M is zero, that's a sublattice reflection, and some of these are sublattice reflections. If M is not zero, and it's either plus or minus one, or plus or minus two, or plus or minus three, or four, in this particular case, and you so you can so see that in the pattern, uh, then those are super lattice reflections. <coughs> now, what happens in a powder pattern? Well, here's a high resolution X-ray powder diffraction pattern of sodium carbonate at room temperature. This is right out of the bottle. Uh, <coughs> and taken it at APS. And most of these reflections are in fact super lattice reflections. There's a really complicated little pattern. Don't try to index it because you can't. It, the indexing routines will simply refuse to index it um, because it's not indexable using an indexing routine. Um, <coughs> so. The result then is a repelt refinement that I've done based on the super lattice model, the superstructure model for sodium carbonate. Um, in using both the first and second order harmonics on, on the atom positions. And so again, here's another representation of a nice little movie showing, first of all, the change in the atom positions as a function of the fourth dimension the shifting of the electron density map as a function of the fourth dimension. Because think about it, the electron density map is going to be changed as you go from one place to another. And this then is also the modulation, yeah, the modulation in the position of one of the sodium atoms along the y-axis um, due to the modulation. So that's, that's this atom here. And you can see it moving back and forth there it goes to one side, and there it goes to the other side, and that's tracking through that sine wave. <clears throat> okay, so what, here's another picture. You've seen this one already. Um, but the detail is, uh, this is the modulation in one direction that's that way. It's roughly a sixth. So it repeats every six unit cells in that direction. This one is roughly a third, so the period here is roughly a third of three times the unit cell, which is actually outlined right there. Uh, you can sort of see it if you look at it. And if you, when you look at this, you can sort of see what's going on, <coughs> is that the carbonate group is rotating uh, while the sodium atoms are oscillating back and forth. And the sodium atoms are basically oscillating pretty much all together in phase from one place to another. Okay. Kinds of things that can be modulated are positions, which you can see. Temperature factors, they can actually change from place to place. Um, site fractions can change from place to place, and also magnetic moments. <clears throat> and these things are described by a space group symbol, a supersymmetry symbol, which looks something like this, is that you have the space group part, you have the modulation vector, uh, and then you have a translation component on the modulation. So there's like three, three sets of stuff. And GSAS2 interprets that symbol as not a lookup, uh, which means that you can use non-standard descriptions for it. And then it will tell you then what the super space group operations are. And you notice there's actually XYZ and there's an extra thing called T or tau. <clears throat> uh, the modulation vectors are things like uh, what's shown there. The translations are, uh, again, shown there, and that has to do whether it's a half, a quarter, a third, or a sixth. And there could be anywhere from one to four of those, and it depends on what the space group is. And GSAS2 will show you what the legal choices are. Um, the modulations can be either a Fourier series, which is typically what ones use,
But there's also a possibility for doing zigzags or sawtooths or block waves, square waves. Um, and they apply to certain sorts of coefficients. Um, now, how many are there possibilities? Well, you know that for three-dimensional crystallography, there's 230 space groups, okay? For three plus one, there's 4,800 of them. For three plus two, which GSAS2 doesn't deal with, there's two, over 200,000 sp possible space groups. And for three plus three, there's 28 million of them, or 29 million of them. Uh, GSAS2 doesn't bother with three plus two and three plus three, because there simply aren't enough cases. If you really run into one of those, go use Yana. Um, it actually will deal with that situation. And I just don't bother. Uh, the other thing, too, is that you'll find if you go look in the, uh, in the collection of SIF directories of files of, for incommensurate structures, some of them have X for the space group, which means that it was an ad hoc description of the space group. And I don't allow that because they always have, I think anyway, an equivalent legal one with a proper, proper symbol in there. And somebody was just simply being lazy in not determining what the, what the proper space group is for uh, that particular case. I've even found R-centered monoclinic ones. That makes no sense at all to me. Um, R-centering monoclinic? No, sorry. <clears throat> all right, what do we have next? Okay, magnetic structure, I showed you this earlier. Uh, almost to the end, charge flipping. What's the algorithm? Well, first of all, you, this happens to be with single crystal data, but it doesn't make any difference. What you need is roughly one angstrom resolution. That is, the D, minimum D spacing is roughly one angstrom. This is atomic resolution data. Um, and you have a unique set, which is some sort of funny slice of reciprocal space. Uh, and in order to do this, you have to take that set fill it out to the full sphere of reflections. You then put that in a box here, uh, which has whatever dimensions happen to be, and then you expand that so it goes to a half angstrom resolution. Now the reason why you do this is because the Fourier transform of this is going to give you the electron density map, and you want that grid to be uh, something like a, a half or a quarter of an angstrom. So the two Reciprocal space and real space grids have to be the same because that's how the fast Fourier transform routines work. And the other thing is done is to shift the origin from the center at zero, zero, zero to one of the corners. So we now have an array here, which are called CEHKL, where the indices are the transformed shifted HKLs and the magnitude is whatever the structure factor is, and it's a complex number. <clears throat> there. So then the algorithm is you start with this big box, you assign random phases to all the structure factors. The ones on the outside here, by the way, are all zeros for the intensity, because you didn't know what they were. Um, <clears throat> you assign random phases to it. You do a fast Fourier transform that gives you the first shot in the electron density map. It's going to have positive regions, negative regions. It's just going to be, but there will be something in it. You then do a charge flip, which takes the negative scattering densities and make them positive. That's that step. You do the inverse Fourier transform. It gives you this box back again. You pull the phases out of this and apply them to that and just repeat. And you go round and round this cycle over and over and over again. Um, and eventually, what should happen is that the phases then begin to describe a crystal structure. Maybe. And here's the algorithm in GSAS2. In a sense, this is ridiculous because it's like 13 lines of Python for the whole charge flipping algorithm. You have the fast Fourier, you have this is the first Fourier transform. Here is you calculate the standard deviation in the map because you need that for the charge flip. 
two flock charge flip steps. One, which I just talked about, there's another one which gets rid of really high peaks and makes them, flattens them out. Um, then you do the inverse transform, uh, avoid a divide by zero, pull out the phase, this is where the divide by zero might happen, <clears throat> pull out the phase, apply the phases to the original set of structure factors, uh, increment cycles, do a little bit of housekeeping, go back and repeat it. All this in about a dozen lines of code. And it just does it over and over and over again, um, up to, I think, 10,000 times. Then when you're done, and you've said, well, hey, it looks like it's fitting, uh, then it repeats this first line to get the map, and then it goes and finds the origin, searches for peaks, and displays the result. And so uh, this is sucrose, where you do the indexing, you wind up with a nice solution here for the peak positions. You then do a poly refinement, uh, get a nice fit to the powder data and a set of structure factors, namely 700 odd reflections, unique ones. And the charge flip then with that expanded box is 61,000 reflections, because that's how many data points, that's how many points that you're gonna need in the map. And so here's uh, the original uh, residual starts off at about 45%. It drops to 17% in the charge flip, which tells you that it's actually found an answer. Um, <clears throat> and the cell has got 46 peaks in it, which is exactly what you would expect for C12, H22, O11, ignoring the hydrogens. So the one-to-one -one corresponds. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Next is lunch, isn't it? <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> almost done. Um, you then identify the atoms carbons and oxygens, build up a model, and then do your refinement. But here's, here's the interesting thing is to look at the phases. What goes on with the phases? Here's a case in which it didn't solve in 10,000 cycles, and I'm looking at five different phases, and they just wander all over creation. Here's one in which it's solved right there. There's a dramatic change in the behavior of the phases, both before the solution and after the solution. And here's an expanded view of the point of solution right about there. Okay, there's a sudden sort of convergence of the phases to a typical, va a particular value, or maybe a pair of values that it uh, oscillates between. You can see the oscillations. <clears throat> and here's another one where in which it's solved right there. And the same sort of thing happens. This is a, chaotic behavior here, and then it suddenly resolves itself. So what's it? what is this? Well, it turns out it's chaos mathematics. It, and, as, and if you look at, if you read about chaos mathematics, you'll find these things, whoops, I'm sorry, these things called strange attractors, something called canter dust, butterfly effect, you know, all that sort of stuff. What's the basin of attraction and so forth? And it's all built on a case where you've got a cyclic algorithm in which you change something in one of the steps and then look at the result and change it the same way over and over and over again. And that is charge flipping. What you're doing is that you're doing this thing over and over again, changing one thing in the cycle, which is the charge flip step. Um, and what you results in is, <clears throat> and then you hit a stable solution eventually. And so what that is, is chaotic phase behavior. And this is a hyperdimensional situation. In fact, with sucrose, you've got 76, 80 dimensions to the problem. Um, and there's no symmetry involved. Um, and if you think about the number of possible solutions, because there's no symmetry, uh, you have an infinite number of possible phases most of which don't describe atoms. There's a smaller infinity of solutions that describe atom positions. Remember, no symmetry, so there's no, you know, you shift the origin, change the phases. <clears throat> so this is what, in their language of chaos math, is known as Cantor dust, where the, the dust points are the solutions um, in this infinite array. Um, 
the phases oscillate and there's a drift and that's characters of something called sympletic strange attractors. The solutions are the strange attractors. Is there a basin of attraction? Namely, if you shift one of the phases, do you come to the same solution? I don't know. Maybe there is. And of course, the key question is, does this, any, does this really matter? I don't know if it matters. Um, I simply throw this out here for people to take a look at and say, well, wait a minute. Okay, that sort of explains what the behavior of charge flipping actually is. It's because you can see that in the phases. It's chaotic behavior, and then it suddenly sets into a solution, falling into the correct answer. And with that, I thank you. <clears throat> questions? Um, for the charge flipping blocks, do you get those phase, uh, does it automatically plot those <coughs> the phase? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's actually, there's actually a place in there in the GUI where you could pick HKL and actually, you know, select your reflections. There's a default set of reflections which are just there. Um, maybe not appropriate in all cases, but, you know, they're there. And so you can actually see it, if you wish. And how do you choose, because you incorporate so many things in, how do you choose what you program yourself? So basically re-implement the programming versus uh, going to someone and talking about incorporating their programming. If I, if I see a good idea, I'll put it in. <laughs> How do you pick the ones you program yourself versus you adopt someone else's? Mm. If there's something out there that I can use and the, and the people at the other end are willing to let me use, I will put it into GSAS 2. Um, uh, for instance, I mean, there's, there's sort of three or four different ways in which we do this. Some of them are... I simply call a routine that someone else wrote. Okay, that's RMC profile. I didn't write it. I don't do anything to RMC profile. I just simply run it. Um, the uh, diff acts, on the other hand, I actually took their code, modified it, so it would fit better with GSAS 2. Okay, and the guy who wrote it said, hey, Please, <laughs> I'll get a lot more citations that way. <laughs> um, another model is where we actually go across the web and call somebody else's package to do something. And that's what that ISO distort thing is. I'll also go to the Bilbao site for getting...